I was more than uh, surprised, happy, and everything that you're you're Persian, man. It's it's so crazy to me. I know when I started, I was the only Iranian in that good life. That's for sure. Well, I used to go with my buddy Sam. He's Persian too. He used to go, but he was just a fan. He didn't make music, but it's a trip that after all these years, you know, there's Iranians that dig that style, which it took like 20 years for that to happen. But <laughs> that's wild, man. Cause I, I, I be so is, is, what's your, is Dan your real name or is it short yeah. for something? No, Dan. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. Dan. Yeah. Okay. What's your last name? Hey yeah. You speak Farsi? Bad. Uh, bad. Okay, good. Shabby, shabby, bad, shabby, happy, Zanam. Oh, man, I'm having to. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, I moved here when I was about three or four from Iran. Oh, and, okay. And um, uh, pretty much it was myself and my mom. And when we, okay. came, we moved a, a lot all over the nation. And um, so as, as, as much as I would like to speak Farsi, I could understand a lot more. Sure, sure. No, I could relate. I mean... I was born in the States in Chicago, mm -hmm. but then after, at age one, we moved to Iran uh, and I lived until age seven till right after, you know, the war started and then we moved here and then here ever since. So my Farsi then was really good, but I kept it up as much as I could. But, you know, when I listen back to videos, when I was speaking, when I was a kid, it was a lot better. So especially in Los Angeles where there's a huge population. Yeah, yeah, there is. And, you know, my parents put me in Farsi class. Yeah. You know, we have to do that and, you know, read, write and all that, But which I'm glad they did, which we're trying to slowly do with my son. Yeah, it, it's, it's tough. <laughs> it's a skill, but it's, it's, it's super important. I think uh, yeah. Farsi yeah. is one of the more demanding languages yeah. in, in the world right now. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's cool, man. So, you know. This is such a trip for me, man, because uh, yeah, cool. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know there was like a uh, uh, Persian brother making music like this, you know, because I found this album when I was like 15, 16. I'm 29 now. And um, oh, OK, it's like I didn't know this was done by someone from my country. Like I was. So <laughs> and then I, I went up to my mom. I was like, Mom, check this. <laughs> you remember I was texting you that shit? I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I was, I was, uh, I saw my mom and I said, yo, mom, you remember the, the, the pomegranates album I showed you with all the old, old songs, but they were like revamped into the funk. And she's mm -hmm. like, yeah. And I was like, this is the guy. He's a Persian guy. And he makes music for these guys. And blah, blah, blah. she was, she was cracking up. She was so happy. Cool. Cool. Yeah. cool. All right. Well, say hi to her. Thank you, man. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Please, you will, man. Uh, so with me today, I got Omid O.D. from, I, I don't know if you're from Project Blow. I'm assuming yeah. so, because you've been rocking. Yeah, yeah definitely. Easy enough. Um, for the people watching this that may not know you, they, they probably should, just because you have a, an extensive list of people you have made music with and for. Mm -hmm. um, before we hop into that, I wanted to ask ask you, what was your history? I know we talked about you being a child. You went back to Iran. You came back to the states. But um, yeah, more or less, I want to I want to know uh, one from my perspective and two, um, what was that like when you decided, hey, I want to create music, mm -hmm. and then as a Persian man, I mean it's not your traditional role to go ahead right. and create music, mm -hmm. especially with rap. Right. 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 It's not traditional. So I, I, I'm sorry if I keep rambling, but uh, please. Oh, I hear you. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited. Cool, cool. Well, thank you for having me. So, I mean, I've always been in the music. I mean, um, you know, I was born in Chicago at age, and then at age one, we moved to Iran because my parents – are both Iranian and they were in Chicago going to school and they had me and then they moved back. Um, and then uh, they always tell me stories because, you know, in, in Iran, when it turns winter, 
there's this tradition where they get all the tables and chairs together. They put this huge blanket mm-hmm. and then in the underneath, they put this like little heater yep. and it's called the Corsi, you know, and the whole family gets around it. So they used to tell me whenever that was the case, I would jump up in the middle and require everyone to just sit around and they would play music and I would dance for everybody and yeah. no one could leave. <laughs> like, you know, I had them hostage. So I was always in the music uh, forever. Um, and then, you know, we moved to LA, af- you know, right after the war started. And I remember, you know, we used to live in an apartment building in Tehran. So I remember hearing the sirens and everyone had to go to the basement. And for me as a kid, it was fun because I used to see all my friends. So I didn't know, I didn't engage how serious it was that, you know, there was bombs dropping. But so I remember all that. So we moved to LA and I started going to school. I started first grade and uh, we moved to Westchester, which is near LAX. I don't know if you're familiar with that. And the uh, elementary I went to is Paseo del Rey Magnet School. So there were kids from every background, black, white, Mexican, Asian. Um, And probably first or second grade, I started hearing hip hop. I think it was the end of second grade or third grade where, you know, at the end of the year, you would have a party in class. Mm -hmm. Remember that? So we had a party and then some kids had a little boom box, put on music and started break dancing. And I remember like my mind just being like opening up like parts of my brain opened up I was like what is this I need to know about this and yeah. be immersed in it immediately and that's just what sparked the hip hop mm-hmm. you know uh, you know love and um, it started I was just a fan I was buying every tape I used to try to break dance but then I was all you know you can see the videos on Instagram trying to pop lock but um, buying every tape you know that I could buying records and I never, the first time I, you know, I was making like little pause mix beats and stuff here and there. But as far as like making music, I think it was like the 10th grade. Uh, I went to my buddy's house for a school project and he happened to have a synthesizer called the Korg DSS-1, mm-hmm. but it had a sampler on it. And, you know, I saw it and I was like, hey, what's that? And he's like, oh, it's a synth that has a sampler. I don't use it. You want it? I was like, all right. So I took it and it had a sampler. It had like a 10-second sampler, no sequencer. So I started just messing around. Making loops. Making loops, making beats for fun. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that's 10th grade. And then 12th grade, when I graduate high school, 93, um, I get a car, I get a Nissan Sentra, my first car, right when I graduate. And at that time, I was listening to, uh, there's a radio station, KXLU, which is based out of Loyola Marymount in Westchester, 88.9 FM. And there's a show, I think one of the first underground hip hop shows called We Came From Beyond, Mm -hmm. hosted by Mike Ann. I used to listen to that all the time. And he would play Freestyle Fellowship. And I was like, oh, you know, this is a dope group. And then he also played, and one time he had this MC named Ganja K on, and I recorded it, and he rapped on Funky Drummer for like 10 minutes. Yeah. And it was the dopest rhyme I ever heard. And at the end, he talked about the good life. And I was like, what's the good life? What's the good life? And I remember Herb Magazine at the time, they would always talk about the good life, good life. So as soon as I got a car, I was like, I got to check out this good life. So I went to the good life. It was, I think it was like, it was the summer of 93. Mm-hmm. In my first, and the f- after 10 minutes of being there, I was like, oh, I, I need to be a part of this somehow. And that sparked the drive to not just make loops for fun. I, I need to become a producer somehow so I could work with these people because I was so blown away with what I was seeing. Like, it was like the perfect, like, it was like a scratch for an itch that I didn't know I needed that just was all of a sudden, bam. I was like, what is this? What is this? Yeah. So that's, you know, made me take it serious and stay in my bedroom till beats came out that I was, you know, proud enough to show people. So that's how, you know, that's how it, you know, elevated. 
That's insane. Um, I could relate a hundred percent. I still loop beats mm -hmm. all the time. Uh, I'm no good at it, but I mean, you know, just like you said, once you hear that, that gem, that like two, three second recording, you're like, this needs to be looped over and over. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's uh, it's all, it's almost like a curse. It's like haunting to not do it, you know. Um, definitely, definitely. One one of the questions that I essentially ask is, uh, when you create uh your music, uh, starting with like your first album, Beneath the Surface, mm -hmm. what was your um creative thought process like, and I guess this is almost a two-part question just because mm -hmm. the type of music you make is very uh, different for 1998 rap. It was very, mm -hmm. uh, the beats were very different. You know, mm -hmm. you picked out samples from different sample boxes and you could hear it. You picked okay. out records and that just shows, I mean, to me, putting the timeline in my head together that, um, you were thinking very differently. Your, your creative thought process was, was a lot different. Um, I want to go into that a little bit. Okay. Well, it all stems back to the good life because in the good life, everyone was about trying to be different and bringing something new. So that was just the train of thought that, it, that I had adapted to, you know, cause mm -hmm. it was totally different from all the music in the stores, you know, like, People like, uh, you know, like Fellowship, Teaspoon Iodine, Abstract Root, OMD. Everyone was super different. And and a big influence was CVE, Chillin' Villain Empire, who is Fish and Rid. They ran, they were MCs, but they also ran the board at The Good Life. And they would play their beats constantly. And they would sample really crazy stuff that... I didn't hear other people sampling and they would flip them in different ways. Like they would sample a lot of weather report, mm -hmm. which is a fusion band. And some of the sounds sounded middle Eastern and, you know, didn't sound like the usual jazz that, or soul yep. that everyone yep. sampled. So that always inspired me. So I always thought, okay, how do I find things that no one else has either? So I would dig, you know, I would dig for jazz and soul and all that, but then, I would also find tapes and records in my parents' collection because they had Iranian records. Yeah. So I started delving into that. And, you know, that's how it kind of happened. It was like, all right, how do I make music that doesn't sound like others, other people? And uh, that's that was my, you know, focus. So that's, it's just all stemmed from the good life, you know, that whole you know, uh, aesthetic that was there. Were your uh, parents uh, initially supportive of you delving into all this? Yeah, you know, I was lucky. They're, they've always been cool about it. Like their whole thing was as long as you also go to school, you get some kind of degree, they're okay with it. So, you uh, know, and I st stuck with that. Like I went to, I got a, a, a audio engineering bachelor's from Lower the Marymount. Mm -hmm. So as long as I showed that I'm not just making music, because they were like, it's funny, they were like, all right, you could do it, but we just don't want you to be like a DJ, like every night you're up at 2 a.m. And, <laughs> and, you know, in a bar, like that's no career. At least do something where, you know, you go into the, uh, you know, the engineering side of it too, and, you know, learn the business side, you know, so as long as I made that promise, they were cool with it, you know? So yeah. I was lucky in that respect, you know? And it's funny, like, like Iranians are always proud of their culture, like the art, the music, but they don't want their kids to be artists and musicians, which is weird. Like you're proud of the tradition. So why not build on it? You know? So it's, it's funny. That's a, that's an insane um, quote, let alone topic you just brought up. I think uh, when I heard, your uh, spinoff from Gugush on uh, the Pomegranates album. Right. Well, that was a compilation I just contributed a song to, but that was just origin the original songs. 
Yeah, they were not they were not manipulated at all. That's how, that's how those songs sound. Really? Yeah. And see, this is this is from a guy who doesn't listen to Iranian music. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That those songs that compilation was put together by Arash Sardinia and DJ Masa. Yeah. And that's- then I knew Arash, and you know, um, I contributed a song and I cleaned up a couple of tracks. But yeah, that's that's just how the songs are because it was seventies, so that was you know. I uh, I I heard that track where it goes like bona da 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 bona. Right, the Jesus Christ superstar melody. Right. And, yeah. Um, it was it was on this uh, maybe like 10, 10 minute mini documentary about skateboarders in Iran. <laughs> Check that out. I don't even know about that. Yo, it's it's good. It, it, was, it was I wouldn't say recent, but it was in the two thousands where a group of pro skaters went to Tehran. Wow. They they went through like this whole obstacle course of just trying to film and meet oh, skaters wow. and everything. But they used that song for uh, I think the intro or after they introduced and they went into like to oh, okay that's dope to see all the graffiti and stuff. But um, yeah, send me that. I want to. I gotta watch that. I'll shoot it to you tonight, man. But um, I was I was tying it into the whole Middle Eastern sound, you know. You brought mm-hmm. that to the table, and you know it's a hit. At least to me, it's a hit. Anytime I hear that type of sound, it's a hit to me. So like, even in our digital underground on We Got More. <laughs> It's not exactly Middle Eastern sounding. Right, here. right. Okay, yeah, yeah. I love this on the ground. Um, here, where it goes. Oh yeah, what album? What album is that from? I uh, I have to look up the album. I'm only okay. looking at the individual track, but That's um, dope. going into the Middle Eastern sound. So you were digging through records. You were finding and tapes. Yeah. And tapes and you were finding your parents' music. Um, what what was that point where the light bulb popped up and you're like, this is where I need to start heading? It took a long time. And it's funny because when I would make tracks like that, so many of my friends would say, just do out, just do four albums that sound like that. And I was like, nah, 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 you know, one track is enough, you know? So like, if you go through, like Beneath the Surface has, uh, you know, like Sun Took a Day Off has the Goo sample and then Hazardous Curves, there's, you know, a sample Belly Dance records and things like that. So, and then after that, um, Distant Drummer, there's a track Ease in the Middle Piece where it's a, you know, a Rocky record throughout the beat. And then, oh, dope. And then Monolith had Sound of the Sitar, which is like all kinds of Iranian and, you know, Egyptian records and all kinds of stuff slapped together. But pe- my friends would always tell me, how come you don't do a whole project like that and never click? Like it was like, all right, one track is enough. But I think it took me like saying, all right, it's not just like, let me just try to create something new out of it. It, it takes a long time to really like formulate where yeah. you can really explore and get 
do different styles with it. So it took a long time, you know, it, it took a long time to kind of come up with that. You would, so you, the light bulb clicked and you're like, all right, this is, you know, I'm, I'm digging up gold in the gold mine. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's go down this route. Uh, were you clicked up with the good life and project bloat at this point where. Yeah. You, already. I've been working with them for years. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, 93, I started going to the good life. Yep. By 94, I'm working with tons of rappers there. And then in the 94, we move to Project Blowed. Mm -hmm. And there I'm like working with all of my heroes by then. Yeah. And, and Beneath the Surface comes out in 98. Yep. So that's years and years of me making music with all the cats like Hip Hop Clan, OMD. You know, uh, I was working with um, this group called Low Lifes, which one of the MCs, Famous, was on Beneath the Surface. Another MC, Basic, he did a lot of work with, you know, um, some of the cast from Living Legends, things like that. Um, so I was just working and making tracks with as many people as I could. And then I met Radio Inactive, Shapeshifters, Circus, AWOL. So... I was just trying to make as much music with those cats as possible because I was such a fan and I was just trying to formulate, just get better, you know, just, mm -hmm. so that was my main focus at that time. So how old were you in 93 as your, I graduated high school. So what could that be? <laughs> I don't know. 18, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, 98. So five years after that, you're, you know, early mid twenties. Yeah. Um, and now, by 98, you're very heavy into the scene, as in... By then, yeah. I've LA enough were... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, people are digging the style. They're digging the Middle Eastern roots and the backgrounds. Um, I'm, I'm only going to assume this is after college as well, in 98, where... Well, I was in college um, when Beneath the Surface came out. Mm. I was going to Loyola Marymount and then it's funny because I was a recording arts major and then um, there was a Foley studio. Yeah. With, there's a, it's a studio where you could do a uh, record, you know, sounds for movies, you know, for people that were film majors. Mm -hmm. So um, during this, one of the summers, uh, I asked the professor, hey, you know, can I come and use the studio? And he's like, well, how about this? I'll put your name on the list. You'll get paid. Whenever a film student needs you, you just come and help them. But you, but you have access to the studio. Yeah. I was like, okay. And then that ended up being where we recorded Shaka Doom. My buddy Elvin, also known as DJ Nobody, was in school with me. He recorded the Sun Got Sun stuff there. We recorded so much stuff in that, you know, Foley studio at LMU. So, Shaka Doom is a is a <laughs> it for me. Shaka so. Doom and um that one other track on that album um the beginnings like this scientist he's like sounds sensible. Oh, uh, oh, I uh, got you on the run. Yep. Sensible. A modicum of caution is required in every soldier. Uh, but, uh... In most disputes, the basic aggressive threat signals are strong enough to put a stop to the dispute without the contestants coming to blows. Then everybody uses a peaceful signal. They have nothing to worry about. So The doom, 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 doom. Oh my God. I, I remember when I found the Shaka Doom album, I was just repeat all the time. Just because nice. I, 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 I mean, not only appreciated the sounds, but appreciated how the lyrics were almost, uh, you know, there was a synergy between the lyrics and the sound, which, which I hope any album in the world 
is like that but especially on that album it was it was like it, they were married together it's like they practice you know just a whole different type of sound yeah well nobody and i were just so happy and excited because freestyle fellowship was our heroes and we were all of a sudden able to work with them yeah and we were the biggest fans but we're trying to play like oh yeah we're just producers you know but and just be seeing them watching them and they had been broken up for years because after inner city they broke up broke up jupiter you know was unfortunately away for a few years so he had just gotten back so for us not only to be able to work with them but just to watch them record those songs and write them right there we were just like so giddy we were just like i wish we filmed a lot of that stuff that's the one thing i you know regret but then the thing though is that what people don't know is that those songs those those are just the songs that we recorded unfortunately they were not getting along that well so they broke up again but those aren't like just the best songs those are just the songs we started to do like yeah. elvin and i were like let's do like 50 songs and then put the best songs we, we were making beats ready we are we had other beats that they were writing to but unfortunately things fell apart they just the chemistry the music chemistry was there but they weren't really getting along and individual chemistry arguments all the time and then you know that's so shaka doom ended up coming out a year later because jupiter was like hey i want to put those songs out and i gave him the songs that were recorded and he put it out on vinyl and cd and all that so i'm glad it came out but so much more could have came out of those times and those sessions you know i think that's a very important piece to talk about uh really the interviews that i conduct revolve around three questions and one of the questions would be what are you know the main challenges you have faced not only as a person but as an artist when you are creating these things well you know i i learned so much it's, it's tough to say but you know like i think the biggest challenge for me and i don't deal with it as much anymore because i focus on instrumental mm -hmm. projects so i don't have anyone to argue with but it's you know when you're dealing with mcs you know you're called the producer but there's it takes a lot for them to trust you and to do something over or you know try to point them in a direction instead of okay you made the beat i'm gonna rap over it just record and whatever i record it's the best thing in the world just that's the song you know yeah. and elvin and i struggled with not only them but a lot of people we work with where okay let us produce this song let, let's try to come up with some ideas don't just write a 16 bar verse over this beat let's like try to create a concept like trust us when we say hey we like that verse but can you do something different or could you try this you know and mcs a lot of times are like how dare you question what i just did you know right so right. that's been the that was the biggest challenge working with all the mcs i worked with back in the day mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so now that i focus mainly on instrumental music i feel so free that it's hard for me to even go back to working with MCs because I'm so used to totally being in charge. Mm -hmm. So, you know, eventually I do want to go back and work with a lot of those cats, but that's going to be an interesting, you know, um, situation, <laughs> you know, to see how much trust I could get out of them to be like, Hey, just trust me, just do as I say, it's going to come out good. I mean, you've made, six albums and you have like a, a six correct um i think okay let me see there's beneath the surface this and drummer monolith and then i did a whole album with satch um me and elvin did the la cool project and then i've done tracks on so many projects like right scarab right. and kamal and yeah afterwards three modern persian speech sounds and then yeah. I, won't even, I won't even get into the singles because that's like a whole yeah, tons of singles, tons yeah. of singles, yeah. I couldn't imagine that you would find any difficulty um, 
I mean, now getting back, you work, you're working with the MC. I wouldn't, I wouldn't foresee any difficulty just because you built that. Yeah. You know, resume. Um, aside from that, you know, what about in your younger days, any challenges, you know, any, any moments where you're like, maybe I should just give up. Uh, well, I never wanted to give up because I had the drive because I love the music so much and I wanted to be part of it. And I had, so many ideas the toughest thing was not giving up until i had a track that i was proud of proud enough to show somebody and that's the thing like you got to put in you know weeks and months and nights and sleepless nights just to get that track right and hopefully you know the mc you want to work with will like it and you know be inspired to write something to it that's that was the toughest part is like because you know, just developing a sound and it, it's, it's tough when you're sample based, you know, you got to, you're digging and trying to find stuff to put together and come out in a unique way. So that was the biggest, you know, challenge is, you know, just being um, disciplined enough to put in the hours, put in the work for something good to come out. Um, do you mentioned the part about putting in the hours and, having the drive if i'll get into that question a bit later yeah no problem. Um, so going back into your creative drive where where do you think that really stems from like you're talking about your culture you're talking about how you were brought up in the country um how do you mesh that together and how how did you pretty much going to saying, yes, this is where my creativity comes from. Right. Well, I mean, in the work, so I was making beats with samples mm -hmm. and, you know, and trying to make music for MCs that are not the average MCs that are just, you know, just the regular old stuff. They do crazy stuff. They sound like jazz, you know, vocalists a lot of the time. Right. So I'm used to working with, off the wall stuff. And then when I shift to focusing on, you know, drawing from Iranian Middle Eastern sources, I already have that open mind already. Mm -hmm. And then I started digging not only just tapes and records, you know, my father has lots of tapes of the Iranian radio yeah. from, you know, in the videos and finding so many dope little the way they talk, the commercials, yeah. the poetry, yeah. and then some of the way they, the way they talk so kind of sound, reminds me of like Good Life, Project Blowed, you know, like how do I make that happen? Like modern person speech sounds, I try to chop up the, you know, the kids talking to make it sound like they're chopping, you know, like, mm -hmm. so that's what I'm trying to do. Like, how do I create like, like a beneath the surface vibe, but with Iranian samples, with you know, Middle Eastern synth sounds, you know, so that's the whole world that I'm exploring, you know, so it's endless. Have you, have you hit, have you been hit up by uh, others of our kind? Like saying, yo, you're, you're, like, you're yeah. like my hero? Well, I don't know about my hero, but I get hit up all the time. And right now I'm talking with a few different MCs that live in Iran. Yeah. That I'm, trying to work with you know and wow. that are dope you know and that's what i'm trying to do on my next project have a couple of them on there trying to make it sound you know the the challenge is making the song good enough that somebody that doesn't speak farsi would like it mm -hmm. you know because when you listen to hip-hop in other languages you know you don't know what they're saying so you yeah. want it to at least have a style where you can just follow up you know that's why like a lot of the egyptian electro chavi stuff even though i don't know what they're saying the way they're rhyming is dope you know and then sometimes you know spanish rap or french brazilian rap. rap french rap french rap too there's a lot of arabic french rap too i don't know what they're saying but the way they do it it sounds dope you can still bump it that's what i'm that's the challenge you know i, I just don't want iranians to like it i want everyone to dig it so yeah. I think, um, especially with our culture, like you said, a, a person talking the language 
yeah. you know, like a news broadcaster, a radio broadcaster. It's very artistic sounding just because the yeah. language goes back so deep. 